G'day, welcome to the ADF Insider Essentials channel where today we're taking a relaxing swim in the application module pool. My name's Chris Muir, I'm a product manager for Oracle's development tool section at Oracle Corporation. This is a first in a series of videos to explore the application module pool in ADF business components. For quite a few customers, they're really quite afraid to get into the pool as they don't know how to swim. I mean, I don't know, they don't know how to swim amongst the sea of options and features. But as we'll discover, the pool really isn't that deep and is fairly easy to configure for your needs once you know what the options do. In this episode, we'll be covering a basic introduction, including why we need the application module pool in the first place. Over a set of episodes on the ADF Insider Essentials YouTube channel, we will be covering a number of topics to get you happily swimming in the ADF Business Components application module pool. As we said in this episode, we'll be covering a brief introduction on the need for the application module pool. Then in further episodes, we're going to investigate the absolute basic settings you need to know. And then in later episodes, we'll take a deep dive into the concepts of passivation and activation. Then we'll look at the parameters that are responsible for keeping the pool clean. Once with the basics out of the way, in some future episodes, we'll investigate the advanced options and how to monitor the pool at runtime. And then we'll finish that off with best practice and recommendations on how to keep your pool healthy. So let's kick off with a basic introduction covering the need for the application module pool. So let's start with a very brief introduction on the generalized concept of a pool in computing. Now, I'm going to guess that most Java enterprise programmers such as yourselves are going to be familiar with at least the term connection pool. But let's step further back and consider, again consider the general concept of a pool. Now, a pool is typically a collection of computing resources, a cache, if you will, of those resources that can be shared amongst processes at runtime. For example, we have object pools, thread pools, connection pools that we already mentioned, memory pools, all sorts of different pools depending on your architecture. So returning to the connection pool as an example, this is usually a collection of connections to a database that can be shared amongst consuming processes. For ADF programmers, many of you would already be familiar with the WebLogic server connection pool. So, now the sharing of resources provides a number of advantages that applications and processes can make use of. Firstly, the pool will pre-initialize the resources before farming them out upon requests using a standard configuration such that the consuming processes don't have to write that code themselves and don't have to define those settings themselves. It's standardized. Now this cuts down on the amount of code and potential configuration mistakes that developers often inject into their code as well as making it fairly easy from a maintenance and administration perspective to check the settings in one place if something is going wrong or you need to change them. Next, the big advantage is that the resources are reusable again and again amongst consumers. So rather than a consumer using a resource and holding onto it for its lifetime, as most computing processes, particularly in web applications where the computing process may be a thread or a process for a user session, because users tend to idle very, for very long times in web applications, we can make use of that idle compute time. So the pool resource is shared amongst processes to make use of that idle time, sharing it amongst many more users. So this really leads on to the last advantage and the biggest one of pooling and why we use it in the first place. Because we share these resources amongst consuming processes, a pool allows our applications to scale beyond the limited resources ultimately making our applications much more scalable. And as you can appreciate, this is a good thing in multi-user three-tier environments like ADF, for example. So in this ADF Insider Essentials video, our goal is to talk and explain about ADF Business Components application module pools. So we'll assume from here on in, you have a general understanding of the concept of a pool and why we want them. And we'll also understand, well, appreciate that you already have an understanding of a connection pool, and what we're going to do is use your knowledge and expertise in understanding pools and connection pools to really introduce and further explain the concept of application module pools in more detail. 
So in starting out with ADF, most ADF developers become familiar with ADF business components and the basic concepts such as entity objects, view objects and application modules. We often abbreviate these as EOs, VOs and AMs, just easier to say. Now in covering the application module or AMs, developers typically learn early on that an application module is responsible for things like exposing the view objects to the front end client, defining master detail relationships between the view objects using links, exposing client interface methods which allow developers to create pro programmatic routines to manipulate the underlying ADF business component objects. But more relevant to this series of videos, developers also typically learn that the application module or AM is responsible for, well, transactions against a data source. So typically an Oracle data source, which requires a connection to the database. And application modules are also responsible for managing the user's state, often referred to as session states. Essentially, the session state or user state held in ADF business components in the application module is the variables and values maintained during the user session, like entity object updates, view object current rows, bind variables, and much, much more. Now, it's these last two responsibilities, that is transaction and state management, that lead on to a detailed discussion of the application module pool. But before we can jump into discussing the AM pool, we must cover these two concepts, again, that is transactions and state management, to ensure all viewers have a solid understanding of what they mean. So let's first cover off what is a transaction. Now at this point, I can hear a number of developers or viewers scoffing <laughs> at the very question. Imagine asking Oracle employees or Oracle staff or Oracle customers and Oracle developers who are used to working with something like the Oracle database and its highly sophisticated transaction capabilities, what a transaction is. But bear with me because there is something that even experienced Oracle developers forget about transactions and it's very relevant to the discussion on the application module pool. In revisiting transactions, a common definition is, well, unlike the layman's definition of a transaction with a bank where a transaction involves somebody giving money over the counter as one event, rather from a computing perspective, a transaction is a collection of work with a defined start and end. As we can see here in terms of a database transaction, it starts with an insert, update, query, and then a delete, and it can be any combination of these and as many as you want. Then, at the conclusion of our work, and that's up to you to decide when the conclusion is, we commit or save the entire collection of work. Alternatively, at the end, you can issue a rollback, which will undo all the operations as if they'd never happened. The primary advantage of this is, if we hit an error along the way, we don't get stuck with a half-completed transaction which we need to manually tidy up. The rollback will undo all the changes to date. In addition, other users are isolated from the transaction until the complete work is done. They don't get to see it halfway along where the data may be in an incomplete state or transition. They only get to see the changes once they are completed in full. So that's a basic definition of a transaction and one you're likely to be asked in an interview. Yet that's not all. Transactions aren't just about commits and rollbacks. Another thing transactions allow us to do is chain a number of user operations or actions together. They're not just separate atomic actions in their own right. And it is possible during that transaction for the current user to see the changes they've previously made in that transaction. So if action one was an update to a record, action two and three and so on and so forth can query back and see the results of action one and further oper operate upon those changes. So while those changes have yet to be committed and are not visible to other users, they are visible to the current user session. As such, transactions are also a form of state management. They carry the data changes of the user session forward until either the transaction is committed or rolled back. But what's this got to do with ADF? 
As we said, ADF Business Component Application Modules provide transactional capabilities with the underlying ADF Business Component objects, such as entity objects and view objects. The Application Module, or AM, is designed across separate web requests to our application for a user session to maintain the state of the transaction, and therefore the state of the business components for that user session. Hang on a minute. Now I'm sure that I've read that HTTP, that is, the protocol that browsers use to communicate with web servers and their applications, such as those written in ADF, are stateless. How is it that ADF business component application modules carry state, but the web can't? Well, it is true, HTTP is stateless. HTTP is the protocol under which the browser and servers communicate to each other. It has no ability to remember anything between invocations across requests and responses. Typically, each request hitting the server is treated as an entirely atomic request, and the server just returns the page without considering who the requester is. So this is ideal for serving static content, such as scientific papers, which HTTP was originally designed for. Yet, when we move from the web world and websites to that of applications, also known as web applications, like an online store, or more complex business applications like those Oracle's customers such as yourself require, then the stateless nature of HTTP isn't good enough. For example, imagine a shopping cart application. Now, a shopping cart website typically allows you to A search the website for an item to buy, b, visit the item's description on a separate page and add it to your cart, then repeat until you have all the items that you want to buy, and once you have them all, you then d, go on to or go to your shopping cart. Once you're at the cart, you then typically enter your credit card details, then enter your address, agree to the postage, and pay and wait for your items to arrive via the post. Now, if we can't support the concept of state in HTTP as we described, then you'd be forced to, on each page of the shopping application that you want to buy an item, to enter your credit card details, enter your address, pay separate postage, and buy the item, one by one. Now, of course, not only will this be annoying to enter all your details again and again, validate your credit card details again and again, type your address in again and again, you're even going to have to pay for postage again and again. This really isn't desirable. So to get around this, application server developers have created numerous mechanisms and solutions to solve this problem. The solutions over time have changed. Historically, cookies were popular and are still used, and encoding state in the URL is another one, as well as managing state on the server. It's this last one that comes around to our discussion here on the application module pool. For ADF business component applications, you have the possibility of managing considerable amount of state around interacting with the database. And the resulting state or data or data is stored in entity object caches, view objects, and so on, all managed by the application module. And this is where we come a full circle to describe the ADF business component application module responsibilities, that of transaction and state management. Now, an ADF application is not just about one user and managing that user's transaction and state within ADF business components. An ADF application can scale to hundreds, if not thousands of users, both over time and concurrently. So how does ADF business components handle this? How can the one application module you create at design time scale out to thousands of users at runtime, or requiring that single application module? Well, firstly, the application module at design time, represented by the oracle.jbo.server.appModuleImpl class, can be instantiated as many times as there are user sessions to our application. There is no theoretical limit. As long as you have enough memory for all the underlying entity objects and view objects, the EOs and the VOs, and all the memory they require, essentially their state, for every application module, for every user session, you are fine. 
So theoretically, let's say an application module instance and all its EOs and VOs state takes an average of about one megabyte per user session. Now, what each user session takes in your application for real and a real world application really depends on your design, how many EOs and VOs you have grouped under the AM and how many of those EOs and VOs your user visits during their session and how many records you pull in and you've configured the tuning options and so on and so forth. But here, for our purposes of demonstration and discussion, one megabyte for our purposes is a nice round number to work with. Then let's say our Java virtual machine heap has a maximum memory size of 500 megabytes. Let's next assume 100 megabytes of the heap will be taken up with the WebLogic server and ADF runtimes, leaving us around 400 megabytes to work with. So the theoretical number of users we can support is approximately, well, one megabyte into 400 megabyte is 400 users. Hmm, 400 users for one server doesn't sound very good. I guess we can always increase our memory or scale out our servers to increase this number using a cluster, yet I wonder if we can do better than that with the resources at hand. Well, there is a little human characteristic we can take advantage of with web applications that allow us to scale out. So as we know, computers are fast, very fast, so mind-numbingly fast that if you try to count up to the number of operations a modern desktop computer does in one minute, you need to count to around 6,000 million. Yet in comparison, Relatively speaking, humans are slow, very slow, so incredibly tediously slow that sometimes we can barely do one thing in a minute, sometimes one thing in 10 minutes. So our server is holding state for around 400 user sessions, but for the majority of say one minute, the server only does say around 400 options or operations for our mostly idle users. So our server is holding state for around 400 user sessions. But for the majority of say one minute, the server only does say 400 operations for our mostly idle users. And the computer is capable of doing another 5,600 million other operations. Hmm, so maybe we could use that compute time to good effect to scale out to support more users. Maybe what we could do when we receive a request for the 401st user, we take one of the existing sessions and store its state somewhere else temporarily, and now reset the application module and its, use, its freed memory for the new user. So this way we can scale out the number of users that we can support. And if the original 400th user comes back, we then just reverse the process. We flush one of the current active users to the temporary store, reset the application module, then reload it with the data that was stored in the temporary store for the 400th user. From the 400th user's perspective, they won't know any different. It's as if all their state changes were maintained over requests, essentially a stateful transaction over HTTP. So this nicely leads us into a discussion on the concept of the ADF business component application module pool. This is exactly what it does. It provides a sessions the ability to maintain view objects and any objects and their associated states. It allows a limited memory, amount of memory I should say, to be shared with other sessions. It exploits session think time to reuse application modules and the EOs and VOs memory with other sessions. And it passivates and activates AMs, VOs and EO state to the database as a temporary store. And that's where we're going to leave it in this episode. In the next ADF Insider Essentials recording on the application module pool, we're going to discuss the basic settings that also explain how the application module pool scales to support multiple users. So I hope you will join us for a swim in the pool in the next episode. Hope you'll come along and dip your toes again with us where we'll continue to educate you about how the pool is really quite a nice place to spend some time when you're developing ADF applications. Cheerio.